it's safe. You know what's in here? I've got some rocks. How do you know it was rocks? Somebody said rocks. Oh, you said rocks because you knew. You cheated. <laughs> I want you to look at these. And I want you to feel them. I'll get that one later. Then I've got one more that we're going to look at in a minute. Are those rough or are those smooth? They're smooth, you know? Uh, well, yeah, they're a little bit rough, but not as rough as that they would be if they hadn't been from a stream where water flowed over those. Those are called river rocks, and I have them in my garden. Uh, to as decoration, but uh, and I got I got all of those out of my garden because they've all been in river where water has flowed over them for years and years and years, and you know what it does? It tumbles them and it rubs off all the rough edges. You know, would you rather feel? A, oh, and then I've got this rock, which was given to Kaylee one day um, by a jeweler. She was making jewelry, and uh, she isn't that pretty. It's got all kinds of it's got all kinds of pretty colors. You know, I don't know how that happens, but I have a feeling that when rocks have different colors, like some of these do, it's where God kind of munched up some rocks together so that one rock's one color, another rock's another color, and that all the rocks get. Uh, rolled up into one big, into one little rock, or a big rock, and then they get all the rough edges rubbed off. Now, let me ask you a question. Would you rather rub a smooth rock or a rough rock? Well, you want a rough one. You want a rough one. You want a smooth one. Okay. You want the rough one? You want the rough one. Everybody. Just about. Let's see, how many kids we have? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And so 16 out of 18 won smooth rocks. I'd say that's a pretty good percentage, wouldn't you? You know what? That's what God wants you to be. God wants you to be like a smooth rock with all the rough edges worn off. And only God can do that because we go to God to Jesus with all our problems and all our little sneaky things and our little temper tantrums and all those kinds of things. And when we do those things, God rubs the rough edges off of us and makes us smooth and nice to other people. And that's how we show other people. That's how we show other people the pretty colors that God puts inside each of us. God puts pretty colors inside all of us. And uh, now that one didn't get rough, didn't get polished in water. That one got polished in a jeweler's polishing tool. That's why it's, it's not just smooth, it's polished. And you know what happens when you just give your life to Jesus? He not only smooths off the rough edges, and he brings out the colors that, uh, that bring other people to him. But he polishes us up as well. Don't you all want to be polished by God? Yes, we do. Let us pray. Let me see.
at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and they sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loose. That is our passage of scripture that Jamie read for you earlier. I want to review just a little bit. Pastor Beck brought up the point of the box. The box is a self-preservation. The box represents pride. The box equals arrogance. The box equals tradition. There's nothing wrong with all tradition. There is some traditions that bind us. Other traditions are beautiful. We have to figure out which one are beautiful. We have to figure out which ones are binding us. That's a hard task to do. And that's why we are in this series called Outside the Box. Because we're trying to figure out what we as a church should be. I know one thing, we need to be a healthy church. And a healthy church has what we've been talking about over the last few weeks. We have to be aware of evangelism. We have to be aware of ministry. We have to be aware of fellowship. And today we're going to talk about worship. Worship is another key ingredient to make a healthy church. I find it strange sometimes that new believers, those who just come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, sometimes are more outward worshipers than the established church people that have been in church for quite some time. I remember someone saying to me, you never forget where you come from. And I think that is so true. In all of our lives, we should never forget where we come from. Especially where we've been to where we are now. You would think that it would be the other way around as people who have been forgiven, people that have been redeemed, people that have been blessed, should show more reasons to worship God than what we do. But I will say this to you this morning. Something happens when people come in here and you sit in that pew. Something happens. Someone who has just been baptized or someone who has the feeling of the Spirit in their lives does not usually have these problems as they have no walls that are around them. They are excited about what God has done in their lives. But sometimes, over time, we allow the things of this world, we allow family issues, we allow financial issues, we allow church issues, we allow anything that we can, we allow that to rob us of our joy. We allow that to take presence in our life and we forget sometimes where we've come from. We forget about that excitement that we need in our lives. And we allow that to control us more than we allow the Spirit of God to control us. Now I'm not standing up here putting anybody down because we all face this. We all struggle with this. And we have to find ourselves. We have to catch ourselves sometimes to say, hey, Lord, you know, like in the play last week, Lord, I've lost my joy. I've lost my joy in serving you. I've lost my joy in worshiping you. I need a new dose of that joy. I need, I need something to take place. And I think about that, you know, the world that we live in, it does not worship God. It doesn't worship God. And it's hard for us as Christians to live in this world because the Bible tells us that we have to live in the world. We're just not to be become part of the world. 
But it's hard for us sometimes to live in the world when we're living in a world that does not worship God. They don't look at God the way that you and I look at Him. They don't feel God the way that you and I feel God. And that, that, that is hard. That is something that is very hard for us to do because we can get into uh, uh, the worldly system. We can get into the worldly ways. We can get our, if we, we can find ourselves caught up in the movement of the world if we're not careful. I think about Christianity and I think about how this world looks at Christianity. And I was given a note right before I came up here, which was fascinating to find out that how Christianity in America has dwindled. It's down to 40, 47%. But that's what happens. You see, what happens is the world becomes a part of the church and, you know, the church should be getting out to the world, but the world comes into the church and that's what happens because we start to give in to those things and we start to, uh, in our minds, we start to think, well, this is okay to do, and this is okay to do, and this is okay to do. And we find ourselves battling that each and every day. Listen to me. God established the church to be the church. God established the church to be the light of the world. God established the church to be the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth will lose its flavor. It will lose its salt if we become part of the world instead of what we need to be. So we have to be very careful in this. Because I think about how the world puts Christianity down. How they look at us as freaks. How they look at us as crazy people. And yet, I find myself each and every week, especially during football season, which is my favorite season of the year, I find myself watching people on television that are dressed up, that are crazy people in the stands. They're nuts. You look at them, they're nuts. I mean, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. I, I see people going to festivals and how they dress up as these festivals. And they walk around and they call me a freak. <laughs> do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? People in this world, they don't worship God as they should. Because listen to me. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was God. And the Bible tells me that there's no other God except God. Yet, I find myself watching this world continuously put us down for loving our God and worshiping our God and talking about our God and praying in public about our God. They continuously do this while I watch them worship people and worship sports, and worship NASCAR, and boxers, and how they worship movie stars. They fill stadiums with 10,000s of people who yell and scream to the top of their lungs to cheer their favorite team on. But when it comes to church, when it comes to God, these same people become silent and timid about lifting their voice up and worshiping God. It's almost like they're ashamed for some reason to worship God. Maybe it's out of fear because of the way the world is anymore. People today, and I include Christians in this as well, because I find myself doing it sometimes, and you have to catch yourself. But people today, they can talk to their family, they can talk to their friends about just anything. When it comes to the latest ball games, TV shows, music concerts that they go to and that they've been to, but when it comes to Jesus, 
a lot of times we're too embarrassed or we're timid or sometimes we're even ashamed. <coughs> Exodus 34, 14 says this, For thou shalt worship no other God. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous of God. When you're around people today and they start talking about things that they're excited about, unless you're around me and you want to talk about the bagels, then you're not going to... You're not going to get that, okay? The Bengals or the Reds. But you hear people and they talk about this and that. And they talk about, you know, they talk about it in, in excitement. They talk about, talk about it in enthusiasm. They talk about it in exhilaration, animation. They're thrilled to talk about those things. And those are type of words that you'll usually hear them describing their latest sport event or music concert or something that has been a part of their life that week or that day and you have to ask yourself why is that what is it that inhibits us why what is it that keeps us from entering into worship true worship true outside the box worship what is keeping us from that you don't know who your worship will set free. There are people who come in here bound up by your personal afflictions in your life. And you need to hear some kind of Paul and Silas worship. As J.D. read for us. You need to know that there is deliverance that is available to you. Paul and Silas took their praise and worship outside the box. Wednesday night, my father, I, I, I called my father uh, at, at, the, at the last moment and asked him if he could come and fill in for me Wednesday night because there was a family, I truly felt there was a family that needed me. They had just lost their husband, they had just lost their dad. And, and at a young age, 42 years old, and they woke up that morning like life was as it was. And in a moment, in just a short period of time, their life was turned upside down. And I felt like as a pastor, as a friend, I felt like I needed to get outside the box Wednesday. Instead of coming in here and teaching a lesson, I felt like I needed to go and and let God use me outside the box for this funeral service. And I have to tell you, it's been a nerve-wracking week, and it's hard to speak at funerals when you don't know somebody really well, and you don't know if they, uh, at one time or another in their life, if they accepted Christ or not. Those are hard funerals to do. And I prayed, I said, Lord, you use me the way that you want to use me. And folks, when I entered into that funeral home Wednesday night, there were hundreds of people there. This gentleman was well known. He was well loved. And that was evident for all the people that were there. And folks, I was able to stand in front of that group and talk about God. Talk about what we need in life. And after that, you never know. You know, my Bible tells me that God's word never goes void. You never know how God is going to use what he gives you for those moments. And I have to say this with all my heart. I was a nervous wreck going in there. And when I got up there, I felt the peace of God. I felt the calmness of God. I felt the anointing of God. And I let God speak. I found out the next day that it reached a lot of people that were there. You never know. But I took that time and I worshiped God outside the box. Just me and God. Yesterday, I stood here. It wasn't hundreds of people. There was a good crowd here. Another thing that God allowed 
for me to share. You see, Paul and Silas, I love this passage of Scripture because Paul and Silas, they took their praise and worship outside the box. They understood what the box was. They were tied to that box. They were chained to that box. Their box was built to contain them. Their box was designed to keep them in. But their praise and their worship took them outside the box. And folks, they didn't need any instruments. All they needed was that time and that presence to be in God's presence. And folks, I don't know what they, they were singing, but I do know this. They were singing God. And God got a hold of that situation. And the glory of God fell down on that place. And the earthquake happened and it loosed their chains. It freed them from that box that was containing them. It freed them from that. And they were free to worship. And they worshiped God the way that was on their heart and in, in the presence of God at that moment. Now we never read on in the passage of scripture, but let me tell you what took place. After their out of the box kind of worship experience, what they did was this. They could have walked away from that jail cell, but they didn't. They stayed there because they had God in their presence. And they stayed there, and the, and the jailer who, who was uh, given the responsibility to watch over them, he was afraid. He was afraid that all the prisoners would leave, and he would lose his life over it. And he runs back there, and he finds Paul and Silas still singing away. Just enjoying the presence of God because there was something when they were outside the box and that worship experience. There was something that was supposed to happen because of their obedience. It was supposed to happen. And listen to me. They went home with that jailer and not only won the jailer to the Lord, they won his family to the Lord. Amen. Amen? That was an out of the box worship experience. Last Sunday, you experienced an out-of-the-box kind of worship service. Something that we normally don't do, but something that God wanted. And because of that, there were lives here last week that were touched by that play that would not be touched by my speaking or any other music. They were touched by that play. And I thought it was so awesome after the play, there were many of you that were coming to me and saying, did we just have an out-of-the-box experience? <laughs> yes, we did. Now see, it didn't hurt, did it? It didn't. You know, a normal service might not touch certain people, but a drama came. And there's a lot of people that related to that. This coming Saturday night, it's called a night of praise. This is something, as the play was laid on Cindy's heart, this is something that has been laid on Casey's heart. And Casey called me and he says, what do I do with this? And I said, brother, you, you just be obedient and follow what the Lord lays on your heart to do. We'll support you. Come here. We'll, break, we'll do it. And ladies and gentlemen, this Saturday night, 630, is to strictly a night of praise. There's going to be people that are part of this church. There's people of other churches. It's just going to be a great time. I challenge you to come. That's out of, out of the box worship. These are kind of settings that we set for our worship and for other things. But let me, let me share something with you. Understand this. God loves praise. God loves to be worshipped. Psalm 22.3 says this, 
Be thou our holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Here's the reason Paul and Silas were able to break out of that Roman jail. Number one, and this is why we need to experience the out-of-the-box worship. And listen to me, out-of-the-box worship is not just coming here on Sunday mornings at 9.30 for Sunday school and small groups, coming in here at 10.30 for our worship hour, coming on Wednesday nights. It's not just that. An out-of-the-box worship is 24-7. It's seven days a week. It's in your life. It's you. It becomes you. And the reason why Paul and Silas were able to have that breakout in that Roman jail where they were confined, where they were being persecuted, and, and everybody was against them. That world was against them. The reason why they could experience this is because of number one, their God could not be constrained. Number two, he is a God who is bigger than any of your situations. Number three, he is stronger than the enemy who sought to destroy them. Number four, the scriptures tell us that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Number five, that little Roman jail wasn't big enough. It wasn't strong enough to hold him in once. They started to praise him. Couldn't do it. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabits the praise of Israel. That little bit of jail cell, great big God. Amen. Little bitty box, <laughs> that little bitty box, great big God. Amen. Amen. Your little bitty situation, great big God. Your situation is not nearly as big as the God that we worship around here. Amen. Paul and Silas found out that praise and worship has the tendency to release you from whatever is the enemy that has built around you that is intended to keep you from experiencing God's delivering power. God's delivering power. I think about that and I think about a missionary to Russia who told me years ago that the people in the underground churches would have to sit on their hands so that they would not clap them during the services. If they were caught worshiping God in the service, they would be taken out and shot. So they would sit on their hands because they knew that when the presence of God came into the room, they would not be able to contain their worship, even at the threat of death. Think about that for just a moment. Aren't you glad we live in a country where we have freedom to worship God? I saw something this week, a, a Christian comedian who was talking about the different types of raising the hands in church, you know? And he said, you know, Baptists, a lot of times, we don't like to raise hands because we've been taught that we shouldn't. Now, I came, I was raised up in what you would call a Baptist church. <laughs> and we worship the Lord. I mean, I'm telling you, we worship the Lord. Those beehives and... And all I mean, those, those ladies, they, you know, they would get into it. But have you ever been in church? You're sitting there in church and the Lord comes over you. I, I've talked to some of them and you're like, I don't know what to do. You know, the Lord comes over and you're sitting there and you're like. <laughs> you know, and it's the truth. You're, you're like, you know, give it a head start, you know. <laughs> But I was, talk, I was sitting there and I was listening to this comedian and he was talking about how all the different, you know, praise and worship the Lord, you know. He said the, the window washing, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, Mufasa, you know. He's, all of these things. I'm sitting there. I was laughing at that. But on a serious note, that's not what's all important. 
You know, on a serious note, that's not what's all important. What is important is what comes from here. And some of you feel comfortable in raising your hands. Some of you don't. Don't worry about that. What God is, what is God is looking for is where it's coming from and what's from your heart. I'm so thankful in my life, and I close with this. I'm so thankful in my life that I can wake up in the morning and know that God is there. And I'm so wonderful. I, I, I'm just, I know even as the day goes on, and I might slip up, I might make a mistake, I might do this. It's wonderful to know that my God is there. I was having a rough night last night. Things just going through my mind, going through my head. And I just lay there and I just start praying to the Lord, Lord, take this, take this from me. I don't want this. Take it from me. I don't need to be thinking this. Take it from me. I give it to you. And I have to be honest with you. It was like a, just like a presence of God came over me and I fell right back to sleep. But when I woke up this morning, it was there again. And while I was getting ready, I was just praying, Lord, take this from me. I don't need to be thinking this. I need to get my mind, my heart, everything set on what is about to take place today at church. And immediately, God took it away again. That's the kind of God we serve. It's God that can get you through tough times. It's God that can get you through a tough loss in your life. Whether it be someone you love, or a job, or something that you've lost that has devastated you. It's God that can get you through those times. As Jeff said earlier, it's wonderful to know even when we're having a bad week or a bad day, even when we're feeling sad, sorrowful, when we start to worry, it's great to know that God is there and that He does love us. And it's even more wonderful when we realize how much God loves us and we can sing back to Him and say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Would you bow your heads? Folks, He deserves our prayer.